Hello, welcome everybody to our session today. Um, I'm Robbie Sproul. I'm with Utah State University. And I'll be the moderator. I work for the Teaching and Learning Technology Department and I research and innovate with new technology. Uh, so now I'm gonna turn the time over to our presenter, Jason Tweed, and let him get the ball rolling. Thank you. Um, welcome everybody, um, Jason Tweedy. I work, as was mentioned, Utah State University. I teach in the Department of Sociology, Social Work and Anthropology. I focus on criminal justice. I deal with all the crime and prisons and all that fun stuff to talk about. So um, as the title suggests, we're gonna be talking about open book exams in this session. But before I get started here, uh, I did want to start off with a little bit of a trivia challenge. Now, um, as far as answers go, when you have the answer, feel free to either shout it out in the chat. That way, I mean, if, you, if you're really into Trivial Pursuit and all that, and you wanna make sure you're the first one who got this right, chat, make sure I know who came in first, second, and all that, right? But if you want to um, unmute and shout out an answer as well, that is completely okay. I did want to bring candy, but that's one of the limitations of this whole virtual format, right? I can't really reward you for right answers. Just hopefully the satisfaction that you are smarter than everybody else here will be enough compensation for this, all right? So let's start off with first question here. What was the 14th state to be admitted to the United States? Any takers? Vermont, there we are. Merrill got it right. Vermont, that is correct. From, oh, where are we here? There we are. Vermont. Yeah, it um, wasn't one of the 13 colonies. It was uh, disputed territory with New York and all that for a time, but they resolved their differences, 14th state. All right, next question here. Who scored the, the tournament winning penalty kick in the 1999 FIFA Women's World Cup? For any soccer aficionados out there. Any takers? All right. That one, oh, there we are, Merrill again, Brandy Chastain, yep, very good. Let's go on to the next one here. Where is Karl Marx buried? Yep, uh, not Germany, he's, German descent, but he actually is buried in London, Highgate Cemetery. So Becky got that one. All right, so London. Who was the first author to have two novels win both the Hugo and Nebula Awards? Those are science fiction book awards. So who was the first author to have two novels that win that? Not Isaac Asimov. Not McCaffrey. And I should specify novels, not novellas and all that. This one's a little trickier. Not keys. Orson Scott Card did have two that won both the Hugo and Nebula, but he wasn't the first to do that. Nope, not Haldeman. Any more takers? Give a countdown, five, four, three, two, one. All right. Um, Clark also had two but not the first person to do it. The first person to have two novels was Ursula K. Le Guin, for those who are familiar with her work. All right, 
Um, I did just see in the answers, right? Where is Karl Marx buried in the ground, I guess is technically a correct answer. I didn't see that my chat box was moved down. So that answer was off, uh, off screen. Those ones I give, you know, technical points for if it was an exam in class, right? All right, last question of all this. Okay, your yard is watered using a four zone automatic sprinkler timer. One morning you notice that the grass in zone two of your yard is yellow. You go to the timer and you switch the wires for zones two and three. When you do that, zone three of your sprinkler system works, the water comes on, and zone two still does not work. You go out to the valve for zone two and you turn it on by hand. And when you do that, the sprinklers for zone two come on. What part in the system do you likely need to replace? Any takers on this one? The control box, probably not the control box, right? With the control box, when they switch the wires, right? The station for zone two, you think might be defective, but when you put the wire from zone three into it, it works. So it's not the zone, it's not the actual connection at the box, it's the problem. Buy new grass, that of course is always an acceptable but expensive option. If you had to buy new grass every time it turned yellow, that would be a costly endeavor, right? <laughs> so any other answers before I reveal it here? Valvada, um, I think Kim is, yeah, wires is what we're looking at and uh, valve automation, that's what we would call a uh, solenoid. There we are, the solenoid's a little, uh, device that goes on top of the valve that makes it automatic. The wires connect to it. When a signal goes in, a little magnet pulls up a bar that releases the pressure through the valve through all sorts of science that I don't know. That's why I went into criminal justice and not into engineering, right? But that is what we've got. So that is our, like I say, if you got the right answers, you can, uh, your reward is knowing that you are a wise trivia player. We will get back to this in a second. I didn't just do this for nothing, but, uh, I thought that would be a fun way to start. So let's get into the nuts and bolts of this or just a basic discussion of this up front. And again, feel free to shout out or write in the chat anything you have to say. But when we're looking at open uh, book exams, um, you've got mixed opinions out there among people, whether these are a good thing or a bad thing. Should we use open book exams or should we not? So I just wanted to open it up for a couple of, you know, a minute here. What are some of the concerns or reservations you have with using open book exams? Or on the flip side, what are some of the positives you see of using open book exams in your class, whether it be an online class, in-person class? What do you think? Cheating, right? Certainly a concern. If we have uh, open book, are the students really learning anything or are they just cheating off of someone else, cheating off of some paper. Absolutely, that's one of the concerns. What other concerns do we have out there? Or benefits? Lack of preparation. That certainly gets to be one of the big concerns. If, students, if a student sees open book, what, is, what are they likely to do? Well, I don't have to study because I can just look at the book the whole time, right? Not a problem. Um, Language flu, okay, that's a very good point there. With certain subjects, it might be more concerning than others. If you have to demonstrate some sort of a, a skill or proficiency in it, um, how are you actually going to be able to gauge that? Are you actually gauging their proficiency or their proficiency in Googling an answer, right? Um, things like that are certainly a, a problem. What other ones we got? Any others or benefits even? Anybody see any positives to open book? I think it can teach them real world skills that if they have a problem they need to solve, then they can use their resources like they would in most normal life situations to find an answer to it. I think it just depends on how the question is posed to them and if it's something they can Google or something that you really can't find that through a quick search. Exactly right. If we look at the open book format, 
Um, you'll see this in the research and the arguments being made in favor of open book exams is it is more akin to real life. Um, you are going to, you know, in life as the you know, name of this presentation is life is open book, right? If when we get into life, we, you know, we aren't in a timed hour situation where we can't look at notes or can't look at books. If there's some bit of information we need to know, we can look it up, all right? So more open book equals more complicated and questions harder to grade. Um, absolutely, right? We're going to get into this. I've got some examples of some of the questions I use, I will show you. And you are absolutely right. When it comes to grading them, they take a lot more time to grade than um, a multiple choice test or a short answer test. Um, I think I passed one here. Uh, positive, you can ask them to perform more complicated tasks. Absolutely, right? Um, we can ask them, if we're allowing them access to all the resources, we can get more into the application, perhaps the nuts and bolts of how things uh, function, as opposed to just the, um, where we might feel like that wouldn't be quite fair on a closed book exam to expect them to memorize all these bits of data and then put them all into application and go from there. So absolutely. Very good. I mean, that covers essentially, I mean, there's other aspects too, of course, but that covers the wide range of what we're looking at with open book exams is, okay, we're juxtaposing the ability to um, go more in depth to let them get some real world application against fear that they really aren't doing the work, perhaps they're cheating in some fashion, they are relying on notes, and they don't really understand it, we're getting a false assessment of how well they actually know the material. And of course, the added burden on us of having to go through and grade all of these things, sometimes it gets to be a bit of a process. So um, what I want to do here, um, before I jump into some of my questions, I want to show you some data that I've compiled from, this is one of my classes, it was an intro to criminal justice course. Uh, I teach that periodically, and I have at various times in the past taught at closed book. Students went to the testing center, they had a set amount of time, uh, they had to you know, memorize what uh, the material and go and take the test. Um, the semester that I did at open book, I actually started, it was the semester that COVID hit, uh, fall of I'm sorry, spring of 2020. I actually ended up doing the course as uh, the test open book before COVID really hit because I had a lot of students that were out of state. I had students in Colorado and other places. There was no testing center available close by. Um, they couldn't find proctors, et cetera. It just got to be a bit of a concern. So I said, okay, well, let's try open book. And then COVID hit like a month later, and I felt like that was a, you know, lucky bit of insight <laughs> or lucky preparation I had because we essentially moved to that anyway. Um, but uh, if we look at the scores here, right, you can see that the blue lines there are students that performed, uh, took the exact same test, closed book during the, um, I want to say the fall 2019 semesters when that was. And then the orange was that subsequent semester in spring uh, right afterward. So you can see the distribution. Do students tend to score better when they do open book? In this instance, they did, right? This was my second test and I'll click on here. I can show you the third and fourth test I did. I didn't include my first test because I had changed that fairly significantly between semesters. And so it would be like comparing apples and oranges, but the remaining three were the same. So that was the second test. Um, there we are. Third test looked very similar. And then fourth test, you had some of the closed book students towards the end of the semester actually catching up with um, the, um, the open book test takers. I ran an ANOVA and all these, just comparing the means and all that. Um, for test two and three, the point difference was four out of 30, so about 15%. And then the test difference on test uh, score difference on test four was two points out of 30. So uh, half that, about seven ish, eight ish percent. Okay. So the short answer is yeah, when we, I mean, some of these concerns, we went look at this and say, yeah, on an open book test, students that may not know the information appear to be doing better. That's one way we could interpret this. Are they just, they just looked at the notes and they got the answers? Or 
does open book truly tap in better to how students are learning? What do we take away from all of this data? It gets to be the question. Is it, uh, you know, do the scores go higher because they really know it or does it just go higher because they're looking at their notes and of course it's going to go up? That's part of our concern here. Um, what does the research say on this, right? If we look at the research that people have done into this, do students retain information better? Like we can see from the data in my classes, that was just something I threw together because I was curious. Do they perform better? Sure, but does that mean that they actually know more information? Do they retain that knowledge later when they're asked about it a couple weeks down the road, a month down the road, do they remember it better if they took a closed book exam versus an open book exam to you know, retain and learn that information? The short answer is, the results are mixed. You'll find research that says, yeah, closed book exams, the way to go, right? It helps reinforce um, information memorization so that they have it down the road. You'll find other research that says, no, it really isn't a difference. Or in other instances, now open book actually helps them retain it better down the road. So you're going to find just a mixed bag when it comes to the research on this. Is it really gonna, is it really better for my students or not? Um, the other question that you'll find in the research, do students find open book exams less stressful? Yeah, uh, that seems like a fairly consistent result. It's there's less test anxiety. They don't, um, there's not that buildup to it, right? If I didn't look at it, if I didn't memorize it, I'm going to miss out on something. And um, not having to do that does appear to lessen some of the stress, okay? So if we're looking at, well, what is the research back up? Certainly the benefit is less stressful for students. Does it help them um, retain the information better down the road? That's still an uh, a question we haven't answered definitively. There are various factors that research will look into. Um, and part of the research designs, if you look at it, are interesting, right? If we, um, I mean, how are you doing a post and pretest with this, right? We know that, okay, usually with the research, some students have open books, some students have closed book taking the same exam. How do they assess them on the follow-up to see if they retained it better? Is it all using a closed book exam? And then are you just reflecting the um, effect of having the closed book exam in the first instance? Or you know, do we test it with an open book exam at the end? And does that skew it the other way? It's, it's a hard one to assess. The big thing here is, as was mentioned, right? Open books exams are more like real life. This is tying it back into our trivia for at the beginning of class, right? This is a automatic sprinkler for a uh, valve for those who have never seen one, okay? Um, obviously you've got, right, the pipe in, the pipe out. You got the handle on the top to turn it on manually and off manually. And that thing that's sort of at the back, the black circle with the two white wires coming out of it, that is a solenoid, okay? Why do I know this? My undergraduate, when I was going and get my bachelor's degree, I worked sprinkler tech support <laughs> for uh, orbit irrigation in North Salt Lake. So I would, you know, get off school and then I would sit there and I'd answer people's problems when their sprinkler systems wouldn't work. Okay, um, now let's look at the trivia questions I asked you at the beginning of class. Um, I know that there were, for those who did answer some of them, I think uh, Merrill answered the first couple and I saw uh, some of the others. Be honest, who used Google to find the answer on some of them? Okay, right? If I need to know where Karl Marx is buried or who scored the game winning shot, right? Totally Googled, right? If it's just fact retrieval, I can find that pretty easy and our students know how to find it. They are Google experts, right? They know how to use this technology stuff. If it's just a fact-based thing, they're gonna find that bit of information, right? If they memorize it for our test, great. What happens if they forget it two years down the road when they're out in the workforce? They'll Google it, right? They will find that bit of information. Was anybody able to Google the sprinkler problem? Why not? Why is why can't we Google the answer to the sprinkler problem? Because you created it yourself. Yeah, I created the question, right? And what is the question asking? What is it about the nature of the question that makes it ungoogleable? Problem solving. 
yeah, thought process, pro uh, problem solving, critical thinking, right? I didn't give this diagram. Like if I put up this picture that's on your screen right now and said, okay, draw an arrow to the solenoid, right? A student could do that and say, what does solenoid look like? You type in solenoid picture, find it online. Oh, that's a solenoid, right? But when we have an actual problem that we have to face um, when we're out in the workforce, right? You know, it's not just knowing what the solenoid is and what it looks like, it's knowing how it functions, knowing how it interacts uh, with all the other parts of a sprinkler system and having to then describe it to whoever's got the problem, what they need to look at to fix the problem. That's ultimately what our students are going to be doing, right? They're going to be going out into the workforce and they're going to be problem solvers. That's what our jobs are. We solve problems, right? As educators, people need to be educated and we solve that problem by helping provide that educate, uh, education. If we are sprinkler tech support, like my undergraduate job was, people's uh, sprinkler systems break, they need to know how to fix it. I need to know how it works, not just, you know, the facts right, labeling the parts, but how the stuff actually functions to be able to um, help solve people's problems, okay? So when we are looking at open book exams, I, I'm gonna be straight honest with you, with uh, those open book exam results that I had shown you uh, from my intro class, those were all multiple choice questions, right? 30 multiple choice questions, um, very much in the line of, right? Where is Karl Marx buried, right? They're very much fact-seeking questions. It's a survey course, right? I've got close to 100 students in there. Sometimes writing those more in-depth questions I got to spend time on isn't feasible because I just simply don't have the time to grade all of that, unfortunately, right? But um, if we try to phrase them a bit more like a, um, a real-world scenario, that's when we can see open book exams have a bit more benefit here, right? Because yes, if you're just going to give them a, you know, a trivia based question sort of exam, are they going to do better when they have notes? Yeah, right? It's easy. We can Google it. We can figure those out. We can do um, you know quick searches that way, not a problem. So it's this process of reframing our questions in a way that requires a bit more analysis, a bit more thought, something they would encounter in real life uh, to try and get um, the most out of these open book exams. So what I've got here, a couple of sample questions uh, from, sorry, I've got enough time. Yep. A couple of sample questions I've got from some of my classes. This is from my evidence class. Okay. So um, this would be something that you would perhaps, you know, what I was, what I've been calling a trivia sort of question, but a multiple choice question where we're just asking them a fact that realistically, could they Google it? Probably, right? So we've got the exclusionary rule in United States jurisprudence. The short of the exclusionary rule is that when the cops do something illegal, any evidence they obtain through those illegal means cannot be used in trial. That's the nuts and bolts of it. So this question just asks, okay, the exclusionary rule suppresses evidence, which is collected through illegal uh, police uh, conduct. However, there are some instances in which the court has allowed the introduction of this evidence. Which of the following is not one of those instances? So all I'm asking the students is, which one of the following is not an exception to the rule? Okay, um, inevitable discovery, good faith, exigent circumstances, clemency. Could they Google that or look through the notes that I provide in course or look through their textbook and find that pretty quickly if this was an open book exam. Yeah, right, you just go through and say, okay, exclusionary rule, where does it list the exceptions? One, two, three, clemency isn't one of those answers. I've got it, right? If I open book exam this question, students aren't gonna get as much out of it. They're just going to know how to look through a book and they already know how to do that. I don't need to test their ability to look through a book or to Google something, right? So. The trick is how do I take this question and transform it into something more uh, real world applicable? This is the example I've got, right? Um, I won't read this word for word, right? Um, you're welcome to read it here, but essentially what you've got is a mass murderer called the barber that has murdered and butchered plenty of people. The detective catches the burglar and um, is so upset that they can't find the bodies of all these victims 
that she sprays him down with a fire hose essentially until he confesses to where the bodies are. And he admits that he's buried them in this special contraption under the high school football field that is set to open at halftime on the 50 yard line at the homecoming game this weekend, right? And the question is, can those bodies be used as evidence at trial? Is this gonna be something that they can Google? that they can just look at the book and say, ooh, well, I'll just look at the chapter headings in my book and I'll get this done, not a problem. No, this is gonna have, they're gonna have to know those bits of information or at least be able to find them and read them. But more than that, they're gonna have to understand how they apply, right? They're gonna have to say, well, as we mentioned, the exclusionary rule keeps out evidence that police gain through misconduct. Did the officer engage in misconduct? You bet they did. They sprayed down the defendant until they confessed. That's a no-no. You got a coerced confession out of this person. And then we know that there's another rule that uh, called fruit of the poisonous tree, that any other evidence that you get from that initial bad evidence is also excluded. So if I got him to give an illegal confession and he confessed to the location of the bodies, I only found those bodies because of my illegal confession. So now I can't use those. However, you've got to know the exceptions, which is what the other question was asking, and there's one called inevitable discovery. If the bodies would have been found anyway, we can say now nah, they'll still be let in, and then you have to read this and say, well, he had a timer set up that was going to release the bodies at the 50-yard line at a homecoming game. Whether or not the cop was a jerk and sprayed this guy down with a hose, that was going to happen at the homecoming game on Friday. They would have inevitably been discovered. These are admissible. That's all the processes the student are going to have is going to have to know to answer this question, right? It requires them to know uh, know those things and apply those things. So, is this a better way to assess um, student understanding? Yeah, and with an open book exam, like let's suppose you face this in real life. I mean, the chances of one of our students having a mass murderer named the barber that bar buries bodies under a football field isn't very high, but dealing with a homicide case or dealing with search and seizure issues is gonna be something that they may deal with daily if they're a cop, if they're a prosecutor, et cetera. They're gonna to have to know how to deal with these. Um, what happens when they encounter one of these problems? Are they, you know, is the judge gonna come in and say, no, give me your code book, you can't look at that? No, right? I mean, I did before I went into academia, I was a prosecutor myself, right? Whenever I encountered an issue, I had a case that was interesting. What did I do? I looked up the case law. It's like, okay, I know that there's a law that says something like this, but I don't remember the exact words. Let me get the exact words. Okay, now I know how the application of all this goes. Being able to find information is half this process, right? And that's the half of the process. Sometimes we test with the multiple choice answers. When we get into a more in-depth answer like this, you're not only testing their ability to, you know, either know, know or find that data, but how to apply it, which is really the skill that they're going to be applying in real life. Right? We're going to have, um, they're going to have that sort of, um, those resources available, a code book if you're a cop or a prosecutor. Um, it seems like with, uh, in the medical field, they've got, I can't remember the name of the program that they can use where you you know, it's not WebMD, obviously, but I know they have a program where you can look at uh, possible um, diagnoses based on symptoms, things like that. We have resources we reference, okay? Um, let me look here. I saw something here in the chat. Would it be worthwhile to use the same question in a multiple choice format? That is an excellent question. The short answer would be you can do this. I have, um, I didn't put one in my presentation, but I have questions like this where it's worded in a big fact scenario and then you give them four options, right? Um, like in here, the question is, um, will the bodies be admissible as evidence? Um, you will find this like with the bar exam, they're terrible at this with their multiple choice questions. You can put, yes, the bodies would be admissible because, and they have to pick not just, yes, they'll be admissible because if I put, right, if we have here, are the bodies admissible? Yes, no, flip a coin, half the students are gonna get points just because they guessed right, right? But if you break it down, will the bodies be admissible? Yes, they would be admissible because the, they would inevitably have been discovered. That would be the correct answer. Then you could put as another wrong answer. Yes, the bodies would, have, uh, would be admissible because the officer acted in good faith. 
going with one of the other exceptions. No, the officer didn't act in good faith at all, right? We can do it like that. And we can put answers that require more thought and absolutely you can do it in that fashion. That does cut back on some of your grading concern if you do it in that fashion and those do work. I will say this, I haven't tried this. I thought about this really about 10 minutes before I gave this presentation. With the multiple choice in those questions, I haven't tested the limits of Canvas on how many uh, answer choices you can add, right? I, for those who have put those questions in, it usually starts with four and it says add an answer option. I'm curious to test the limits of that because really some of our concern with multiple choice is if students don't know, they still got a one in four chance most of the time of getting points, they don't know it. You know, if we put 10 answer options, we significantly reduce those odds of luck guessing, right? Right. If I have a, I, I can show you another question here. I won't go through it in as much detail because I want to make sure we get done here on time. But I have another question, right, um, about burglary, okay? If we're, or we ha um, have someone breaking into Taco Bell because they want to make some free uh, gorditas and chalupas, but they get to the back stove and they uh, realize they have no idea how to cook a, a gordita nor a chalupa and so they just leave the store and the question is have they what crime have they committed okay and here the way I ask the question is have they committed burglary or not the answer is yes but I could put it as rephrase the question what crime have they committed and I could list 10 different crimes right assault battery murder kidnapping theft burglary robbery um, you know, prostitution, whatever I want to put in there. If I, you can always do that as an option and that helps sort of alleviate that guest option and still allows us to um, get to the nitty gritty application of this. So very good question on that. Something I thought about, and I just didn't get one of the questions in. So thank you for asking that. That was something that I had uh, wanted to bring up but hadn't added. Okay, so um, let me just look at the time here. We're done at, uh, here's what I was going to do. I think we have four minutes left, is that correct? Okay, um, I got blabbering on just a bit too much, Sarah. Um, I was going to have everybody here, right? Your turn, write a question. Think of, yeah, you know, I was gonna have everybody think of perhaps a question or two uh, that would apply to the courses that you teach and find a way to word it in an application manner, right? Um, not just, okay, what is, what are the, you know, in criminal justice, what are the elements of murder? But here's a fact situation. Are they guilty of murder? Um, we won't do that here, obviously, because we're going to be done in four minutes. But that's something I would ask you to do. Think of a question that you've got that's um, maybe currently in a quiz that you use and a test that you use. And think, how could I reword this to be more of an application-based question, something that they could... Um, where it would dem they'd have to demonstrate how this applies uh, in real life, okay? So I won't make you do that now. The last thing I wanted to add here, there we are, is some considerations during a pandemic with open book tests. I will say this, um, with open book tests, one of the nice things during COVID has been the need not to worry about the testing center overcrowding, right? Once COVID hit, it's like, okay, well, we're not going to be in class. So you can't take the test in class. I guess I got to kick it to a testing center. Well, everybody's going to be kicking it to a testing center and everyone has to stay six feet apart. How do we deal with that? If it's open book, you let them do it at home, which uh, format I do, you can, I guess, have them do open book in the testing center as well, right? But if we do it just like that open book at home, go through your notes, get through it, we remove that issue, right? We don't have to worry about crowding there, all the, oh, I hate to say the excuses, but, you know, you have students saying, well, I tried, I went in at, you know, 15 minutes before they closed on the last day and they were busy sort of thing. We don't have to worry about all those sort of issues with uh, the crowding. The other thing I know that um, we have other tools like Proctorio, Honor Lock, and those so uh, software there. Um, without, you know, getting on a soapbox or getting too deep into this, there are concerns that some in academia have with these programs. In particular, these programs function essentially like spyware, right, with uh, uh, keystroke logs and overtaking your webcam and all that sort of stuff. And so you will find a, you know, growing number of people in academia that are against requiring students using these sort of programs um, to take tests. Um, so if you fall into that camp and you don't want to require that as part of your course with an open book exam, 
you don't really have to worry about that. They can look at the at the book, at the notes. We don't need a camera to look, watch them do that. We have permitted. Okay. Um, just got a couple minutes left. So any questions or um, you know comments that anyone has before we get kicked out of this meeting here? <laughs> Is there any strategy or way to manage large numbers in a situation like this where you have like 60 or 100 students that are taking something to, to make it? not so much a simple multiple choice type thing? Um, I, I will tell you what I've done. I've got a class, criminal law. It's one of our, it's not like our intro class. It's not intro to CJ, but it is one of the beginning ones that is required. I have per semester 50 to 60 students. And yeah, this gets to be a pain. What I have changed, what I have changed up doing, and this, it's ended up benefiting me um, as much as the students, I think. I had a lot of students when I'd give them their exam, they would have questions like that and they'd have like, you know, 15 or 20 of those. And in my feedback from students at the end of the semester, they would always say, liked the class, I liked the questions, I liked how I had to really think about them, but man, it took me like four hours to complete your damn exam, right? And so, yeah, what I've done is I've broken up the exam now. So I don't, I don't even do it as an exam week to week, I just, instead of doing 20 in one chunk, I do three a week. That's my new procedure is, here's three of these scenario questions touching specifically on what we're doing for this week, as opposed to 20 at the end of four weeks, where a bunch of the concepts are combined. They're still doing the same amount of questions and I'm still doing the same amount of grading, but I find that when I've only got three, I can get in a groove real quick about, okay, boom, 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 looking for the same common mistakes students are making, the same things are getting right, and I can grade them much faster. So that's one mechanism I've used to try and lessen the um, grading burden of doing it in this method is spreading out the grading over uh, every single week of the course and doing it that way, as opposed to a big massive test every, you know, three to four weeks, I don't know more than that, but. Uh, any other questions? All right, looks like I ran it right to the buzzer, maybe even a minute over. I appreciate you guys coming. Um, and if you have any questions or want any other examples that I've used just to see uh, how I've set stuff up, feel free to email me. Like say I'm at Utah State, it's just my name, jason.tweedy at usu.edu. Awesome, thank you, Jason. I put a feedback, uh, a link that you can um, provide feedback for today's session in the chat. Hope everyone has a nice day. Thank you.